Mexico. Welcome to Christian Homeschoolers of Hawaii's High School and Beyond Zoom session. We've done these in face-to-face -face before because of COVID. Um, we're not able to do that. We still have quite a bit of restrictions. My name is June Mather and I serve on the CHO board. Um, I'm not sure, but Don Mendiola was also going to join us. She's on the CHO board also, and she has graduated one high schooler and um, has another one uh, to still to uh, graduate. But let's get started with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that we have been saved by your grace through Jesus Christ. And because of that rich blessing, Father, we can come to you and seek you and trust that you will guide and direct us in all things, Lord. I thank you for the families who are here to learn about homeschooling through high school. We thank you, Father, for um, just bringing them here tonight. And uh, I truly pray, Father, that what is shared can be an encouragement to them, that our eyes will be turned to you because you are the author and finisher of our faith. And you're the one that will uh, see these families through. You're the one who will encourage them and guide them and provide for them and, and truly bless them, Lord, as they seek you. So we ask your blessings on our time this evening. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so everyone is muted right now. And uh, when we have a Q&A time, um, you can unmute. Um, and it, and if you have a question, um, you can put it in the chat box and my husband will send it to me. And so we, I, I can try and ask, answer the question either during my discussion or more likely during the Q&A time. And I apologize if I, I don't look like I'm looking at you, but I really am. I'm not looking in my microphone because I want to see your faces. And if I look at the microphone, I can't see your faces, but I would rather see your faces. So it's going to look like I'm very impersonal because I'm not looking like at you, but I'm sorry. So tonight is part one. We'll be covering um, why homeschool the high school years, Hawaii's homeschool law and high school, and mapping out the homeschool years. The se session next week will cover record keeping for high school, grading and grade point average, transcripts. And I just learned the other day that we have a bonus session for uh, the following Thursday, June 24th, again from 7 to 8.30 p.m. We have a member of the Hawaii Association for College Admission Counseling, also known as HACAC. Um, and they'll be sharing specifically about college admission. What are colleges looking for in a student? Any additional documentation because of homeschooling? Uh, college fit, finding the right college in terms of academic, social, and financial fit. And then introduction to the financial aid. Um, understanding the basics to make informed decisions about the finances, about going to college, and also exploring scholarship opportunities. Um, so, and then after the session, today's session, I will be sending you an email um, with an evaluation form. And if you can respond to that evaluation within a week, I, I have a deadline. Um, your name will be entered in a drawing for a $50 gift certificate from Rainbow Resources. Uh, Rainbow Resources is a curriculum provider store, and they sell quite a, a array of homeschool curriculum, uh, even for high school. And they also have consultants available if you need help um, with any questions that you might have in making your selections. So let's get started. Why homeschool through high school? Uh, that's a good question. And a number of years ago, Elizabeth Smith, the wife of uh, Homeschool Legal Defense Association President J. Michael Smith wrote an article entitled, Why Homeschool Teens? And this article is timeless. It appears on many homeschool websites, including Cho's website. So if you wanna read the complete article, you can find it on our CHO website. 
I'm not going to go over that, but I'm just going to summarize some of the main points. And actually, let's start with why you began homeschooling in the first place. Maybe if you're a veteran homeschooling parent, you chose to teach your children at home in order to build strong family relationships, focus on character development, and instill biblical values and principles in your children. Maybe you wanted to individualize your children's education according to their strengths, their talents, their interests, things like that. Or maybe you wanted to monitor peer influences and provide a um, positive, safe learning environment. Well, those reasons for starting your homeschool journey are the very same reasons to continue through the high school years. You can continue to provide the supportive family environment and build on what you started so your teens can you can start to see them uh, demonstrate the values that you've instilled in them. You can continue to customize their education. So um, you're meeting their strengths, their weaknesses, kind of pursuing their interests and passions. Your teens can work at their own pace so that um, they can explore their interests or participate in volunteer and community service activities or engage in apprenticeships or go to college early. Um, you can continue to, to provide those positive social relationships um, through church and community activities, through um, outside uh, servicing, service programs, and it's really, to, and then reduce the um, negative peer influence or peer pressure. And there's a lot of other opportunities that arise during the high school years, including earning college credit, I think I mentioned that, or working outside the home, or even starting a business if your teen hasn't already done so. And then there is Civil Air Patrol, there's Junior ROTC, there's speech and debate clubs, there's a National Honor Society, and more. And we'll discuss some of these extracurricular activities later. Um, granted, teaching through high school can be very intimidating um, as we venture into unknown territory. But when you began homeschooling, wasn't it unknown, unfamiliar ground before? So we're just going another step further. So as we approach the high school years, we often think about what our teams are going to teens are going to be missing or um, what, what am I going to fail to provide for them? Am I going to, I mean, I thought this, am I going to ruin them for the, for the rest of their lives? And, you know, we shouldn't focus on the negative. We need to focus on God's blessings and how he has blessed us in the past. And he's going to continue to bless and provide in the future. God never changes in his mercy and his faithfulness to his people. He went before you in your early years, and he's not going to abandon you now. He is good and full of grace and mercy. Amen? So let's figure out how we're going to do this. And we're going to start with knowing the law, because that's really important. Um, I hope you have a copy of the rule, or at least you're familiar with it, um, not only for this these sessions, but always just keep it handy because there might be questions that arise from the school that if you have easy access to the rule, you can ask them what section are you talking about or whatever. And so it's just really good to have it easy, easily accessible. So Hawaii's homeschool law is the chapter 12 compulsory attendance exceptions. And the sections that specifically deal with homeschooling are sections 8, 12, 1 through 4, which are primarily the definitions, and sections 8, 12, 13 through 22. <clears throat> that, and that's going to be our focus for tonight. And we'll have a short Q&A section. So hold on to your questions if you have any questions as I go over the chapter 12 rule. Okay? So. 8, 12, 13 
is Notification of Intent to Homeschool, also known as the NOI. You probably know that you need to submit a notice of intent for high school. Now, if you've been homeschooling for a while, you submitted it for the early grades. And then when your child moved on to middle school, you submitted it for middle school. So now as your child enters high school, you have to submit it for high school. Okay. Cho suggests that you submit the 4140. It's the official DOE form. And the reason for that is it's a recognizable document with the DOE seal on it in the corner somewhere. And so it may be helpful if a student seeks employment during school hours, or he wants to go to a community college while still in high school, or he wants to enlist in the military. Now, your NIA, NOI is sufficient and it should be accepted. And the school is supposed to acknowledge your NOI, your notice of intent with the parent copy of the 4140. And I've been told some schools don't do that and they have to keep on reminding the school. But if you have the official um, 4140 copy attached to your notice of intent, that's fine. But otherwise, the main thing is that you want that parent copy of the 4140 because you need a document for, for several reasons, as I mentioned, okay? Um, 81215 talks about the record of curricula. These are personal records. Even though it's high school, you do not need to show this to the school for approval or acknowledgement of any sort, okay? But you need to keep records. And those records include your um, commencement or starting date and ending date for each school year, the record of number of hours per week spent in instruction. And you probably weren't too strict on this for grade school, but it is gonna be more important for high school. And in the next session, we'll talk about how easily that can be done. Uh, you need to keep a list of the subject areas covered, um, and it, which may include English, math, social sciences, science, physical education, health. Uh, you also have to have a method used to determine mastery of the subject materials and a list of textbooks or other instruction materials that were used, and they'd like you to keep it in bibliographical format. Um, so please keep good records. This is going to be, this is very advantageous for your student. And in our next session, we will talk more specifically about record keeping. 8-12-18, testing and progress reports of homeschooled children. You still need to submit your annual progress reports. They still can be one of several forms. Uh, scores from a nationally norm standardized test. Uh, a written evaluation by a teacher certified to teach in the state of Hawaii, and a written evaluation by the parent, which should include representative samples of work, tests, or grades if you give grades. Now, in grade 10, uh, you are required to submit test scores as you did in grades three, five, and eight, okay? And they actually, when your child does 12th grade, they actually do want you to submit a um, annual report even for the 12th grade because that, but the, I found out that the DOE likes to finish up all their books and close all their, all their books by the end of the school year. And so they can, they can sign you off as you've turned in your report and they can file you away and they'll keep, they'll keep your records for they, they're required to keep it for so many years, but at least your case is closed. Um, let's see, what else? 8, 12, 19, instruct, instructional personnel of homeschooled children. It says parents are qualified instructors. That means for high school as well. You may not feel qualified, but God says you are. And I think it's really kind of neat that the DOE agrees with God on this one. That's kind of neat, I think. 8, 12, 20 credits. The DOE does not grant 
any high school credits for time spent being homeschooled. And that is why the DOE will not issue your high school graduate a diploma from the D Department of Education from the public schools. And what does this mean? It really means good things. It means you and your student can decide what he or she needs to learn during the high school years. It means you can issue a diploma. It doesn't have to come from the school. But why this section? Some people ask, well, why did they do this? And it's really to give and protect your freedom to determine the high school program for your student. Um, without the Department of Education dictating to you what needs to be taught, how it needs to be taught, how it's going to be graded, et cetera. And so I want to help you understand this, I want you to think of a charter school, okay? Charter schools, um, I think there's some on the Big Island and I know on Oahu, we have Myron B. Thompson Academy. This is a charter school. And many families consider themselves homeschoolers because they, their, their students spend a lot of time at home. And in the early grades, the parents have a little bit of flexibility on the curriculum that they can use to teach their children. But in high school, they are required to use what the state um, says can be used for the high school years. And that's because charter school students are actually public school students, they get a diploma from the state of Hawaii. So the state of Hawaii has to approve uh, what curriculum is being used for high school. If you're not with the charter schools and you're following um, the chapter 12, you get to choose what programs you want to use, the pace that you go and how you're going to grade. And we'll get more into that in the session next week. So, The next section, 81221, high school diploma for homeschool children. This kind of goes with the section before. If a homeschool student wants to earn a high school diploma from the local public school, the student must attend high school for a number of uh, minimum of three years and meet the credit requirements for graduation. Well, what does this mean? It kind of well, it means that let's say you have a ninth. You start homeschooling in ninth grade and you do that for ninth grade and 10th grade. And then for some reason, whatever the reason your child needs to go back or um, needs to go to the public school, the credits or grades that you gave and assigned to your high schooler for ninth and 10th grade will not be accepted by the public school. And hence the three years a minimum three years of high school to meet the state's graduation requirements. Now, there is a possibility that courses from a regionally accredited program may be accepted, but um, if you go that route, you should really check with the principal first before you invest that money to use um, an accredited program. If you're thinking, I wanna, I might have to send my child back into the public school. So the bottom line is seriously consider your long-term plan for high school and really think back about why you're homeschooling, you know, the, to individualize the program, to build strong family relationships as Christians, to instill those Christian values. And then one more thing, section 81221 also addresses earning a diploma, this time from the Community School for Adults, C CSA. I suggest you call the particular community school for adults in your area. There have been some changes with this section about what, what will be issued and how to go about it. Um, but generally, a 16 year old or 17 year old can take the GED exam. They'll have to go in with the parent. You have to show the 4140, again, the 4140. Um, and then um, follow whatever procedures the uh, community school for adults says. Okay. Um, 
So be aware, however, there are some situations where you do not want to take the GED for your student. I got some comments from some of the moms on the Big Island that a lot of families have their students take the GED. And you know, before, there was a stigma. I, supposedly there's not as much stigma in that before, but I'm gonna be talking about the military in a, in a few minutes. And um, if your child is interested in joining the military, then he should not, he or she should not take the GED. So we're gonna pause here. Does anybody have any questions about the homeschool law in Hawaii? If you do, you can unmute. No questions? Oh, good, you guys know the rule very well. Okay then. We'll go, we'll go on to mapping out the high school years. We have this in two parts, so part one. And if you can refer to that handout, high school courses that I emailed you as an attachment. And my husband's gonna put it on the screen so that you can see it. Whoa. Okay, so what is on the screen has some modifications from the one I sent you. And that was mainly because I couldn't fit everything on one um, page uh, for the, on the Excel spreadsheet, but it's basically the same thing. So if you look at, at the chart, the core courses are English, social sciences, math, science, foreign language, physical education, health, and then we have fine arts and elective courses. I looked at the DOE um, page and other sources to get a broad view of requirements for high school graduation. So as you can see in the last column, there are a number of courses that will meet these credit requirements. On the screen, what's highlighted in red are your more conventional courses. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to take the exact thing, but you know that, for example, in English, it would be good to have something about composition or expository writing. Um, there would be some type of literature, different types of literature, and then and then what's in black are other things too. So you really want to cover the red the red area, the, the red thing. So like in social science, they, you, you know, you, your students should have world history, American history, maybe government, economics. Um, Hawaiian history is, I believe, required or offered in um, the DOE schools. It's not a requirement for homeschooling because homeschooling has, there's no requirements for you to take um, a, a Hawaiian history class. And I don't think, somebody checked for me and she didn't think that colleges required state history either. So math, you can see, um, you know, at least algebra one, two and geometry. Um, science, there should at least be one or two labs that your student takes. Foreign language, you can take any foreign language, but it's best if it's the credits should be in a single language. So it's not like one year Japanese, one year, one year Japanese one, another year Spanish one, another year French one. Okay, it's it should be two Japanese one and two, or Spanish one, two, and three, or some something like that. Uh, physical education. There's numerous options for this, and we'll talk about how you, how you write something up or put something together for high school. Fine arts would be art, music, drama, photography. Um, I put down um, JROTC because I, I, I found out that the um, Department of Education actually recognizes JROTC and it's not really the, their fine arts program, but that type of category. Um, I included the DOE requirements for 
just for comparison's sake, it actually adds up to only 23.5 credits because I did not include the personal transition plan, which is half a credit. And I'm not gonna go into details about the DOE requirements, mainly because again, homeschoolers do not have to, are not required to take the same courses as, a, as the, D, the Hawaii public schools. If you wanna kind of use it to see what they take, um, that's okay. But remember the schools don't recognize your high school credits or courses, and they're not gonna issue your um, graduate a diploma. So this is just for you to see how it compares. And what they have is really so that a student who goes to the public school in Hawaii would be able to go into college. So if you, if you look at the column with the college prep, you'll see that hmm, they're about the same. The reason why some of them have a plus is that because if you wanna go into a more academic college, your student's going to a more academic college, then they might have to take more courses in English, more courses in math, et cetera. Um, fine arts, um, one more thing is that it's listed separately from the electives because I noticed um, a lot of resources did that either. So, um, but then if your student takes a number of fine art courses more than the, the required, you probably could add these courses under electives. And electives are something that your students should have. Um, think of an elective as supplement to the core courses um, or opportunities to learn practical skills like computer skills, home economics, financial management, CPR, things like that. Um, or there might be er opportunities to just pursue an area of interest for your teen. Okay, um, what's not on here is, oh, one more thing. If you look under college prep, there's a range from like 24 to 30 plus credits. And the, the higher end would be for someone who's um, very academic and pursuing a more competitive college. Um, yeah, pursuing a more competitive college. So what's not on here is extracurricular activities. And that's basically um, what's not gonna be on the academic part of your transcript. And that includes things like community service, volunteering, mission work, sports, um, apprenticeships. And so the question is, when is an activity extracurricular and not an academic course? Well, take this example. Let's say one year your child takes a fine arts course um, in painting. You give a grade and you give a credit. And the following year, your student um, joins a art uh, painting club. And so she goes three and a half hours a week, maybe um, to, to paint and to learn to, you know, see what other people are doing. And so over a year's time, she would have recorded over 150 hours in this painting club. And that's enough hours to earn a credit for painting. But rather than give her a credit for painting, you can choose to use document this as an extracurricular activity. And this would be similar to like if a student was to take four years of speech and debate, okay? Um, so consider not translating everything your child does and learns into a credit, okay? There's more to life than academics. And besides, if you're gonna make it a credit, to me, it's a little bit more challenging because you're gonna have to document um, why it's a credit. How, what were the standards? What, what was the syllabus? What was your child learning for, by taking this class? What were the standards for the grades you gave? What were the number of hours um, of learning, of instruction taking place? So sometimes things are easier to just leave as an extracurricular activity rather than a um, course credit, course. Okay, 
So now, any questions on this so far on the possible courses? And remember, these are just possible courses that you can take, okay? Okay, so now let's refer to the second handout, which is the four-year high school plan, kind of just blank. Um, and this is just a template to help you plan out the high school years. You don't have to use this. Um, this was something that I used and it was just very helpful for me to see what my child was taking in each grade, in each grade level for each subject. Um, you can just pencil in and use a pencil. Um, the course your student will be taking each year and I included eighth grade because sometimes parents will have their child take high school level courses in eighth grade, but make sure they are high school level courses. So example, for example, if your student is really good and is already taking algebra one in eighth grade, then it's okay to give him credit for that, okay? Um, so once you've mapped out your high school years, you've written in what course is going to be for um, ninth grade English, 10th grade English, 11th grade English, 12th grade English, you can start filling in the curriculum or program you're going to use. And if you're wondering how you're gonna do all this, you know, teach all this and teach your younger children to um, feel, feel free to call Rainbow Resource and ask their consultants about what types of curriculum to use. In this sessions, we haven't talked about, um, you know, learning styles, teaching styles, or anything like that. But if you have to, you can go back to um, seeing some, re reviewing some of the videos from the, um, the Homeschool 101 sessions. Um, but depending on your circumstances, you can consider some options if you need some help. Maybe you have a friend who loves dissecting frogs. Or maybe you have a friend who loves teaching higher math. You know, you could swap off with something. Um, or maybe you have to hire. Or there's also correspondence schools. Schools will provide the testing, the grading, and provide a transcript, as well as a diploma. And this could be something like um, Christian Liberty Academy, uh, a satellite schools, or a Becca Academy. Um, I'm not sure if Bob Jones does this, but um, you know, there's a way to take classes. Um, you could consider online distance learning. Um, again, the instructor determines the class requirements. We'll do the grades, the testing. Uh, there is a cost, of course. Um, some places that do it, uh, Patrick Henry College. And Potter School, that's been around for a while. It's expanded in what it's offered and a lot of families have used it. Uh, there's also starting early at the community college or at Wayland Baptist University. And there might be some other universities here on island or off island as well. Um, the community colleges will require you to have your student take a placement test. And then again, the 4140 has to be shown, but um, the, this is a way to um, get some of the coursework done. We had our, did I have two? I had a couple of my kids take foreign language at the community college, because for me, that was a more efficient way for them to learn a foreign language than um, me teaching them or taking it you know, from um, a book because they were actually going to be uh, speaking with a um, instructor. Okay. Um, and then there's advanced placement courses. Um, many of these can be online. Um, the college advanced placement courses, AP courses are courses that have been approved by the college board. And again, you could take them through Patrick Henry or Potter School. This is different from an honors class, okay? Advanced placement is something that's specifically approved by the college board. So with all the resources available nowadays, you can homeschool your teen with confidence. And remember, God is with you. We're not gonna be spending much more time about high school courses, because again, um, 
the HACAC representative will cover what colleges are looking for. So they, they might cover some of, they might go into more depth in some of these things. But for now, does anybody have any questions? I have a question here. Um, I'm gonna read this question first. Can piano and theory count as foreign language? I was told it does. Hmm, that's a new one for me. I don't know. Christy, I would suggest that you, if you have a college that you're, or Christine, I would suggest that if you have a college in mind, that you check with the college to see if this would count as a, as a foreign um, language. I think, I'm thinking that they would, they're expecting something more of a, an actual language. Um, there was a time that some schools, um, there was a time when American Sign Language was very popular, and some schools accepted um, AMSLANG as a foreign language. I don't know, and I don't know if that's still so. And again, it, it you know it might depend on the particular college. Okay, any other questions? Okay, you guys are really good. <laughs> no questions. No anxieties, no fears. I'm gonna do this. Does PE for one semester have to? If I click on it, will I see the whole question or it disappeared? Yeah. Click on chat. Click on chat. I don't see chat. Just oh, under more maybe. Chat. Um. Does PE for one semester have to be completed in one semester's time or can it be spread out throughout the high school years? Could health be spread out into one year? Uh, I, I personally spread out PE um, and because I, um, trying to remember what we did. Um, we spread it out and we wrote different things for it. And it wasn't because it was so that they could learn different things about. Um, I was just kind of thinking about what, what my experience in high school was in PE. And I remember we learned different, um, we kind of rotated through, through different types of sports. We did um, tennis, we did basketball, we did um, archery. I think we did gymnastics. I mean, you know, these were all at the simple level, um, but we were exposed to quite a bit of different sports. Um, that was a time when, you know, female sports wasn't a big thing. So I remember our instructor teaching us um, about football so that we could understand all the football signals so that we didn't look dumb when we went to a football game. So, I mean, that could be something you could learn, you know, you could include in your curriculum. Maybe your, your students know what everything about football is, but, you know, there's other sports and understanding all the signals for soccer, same thing for um, volleyball and um, basketball. So um, some of it can be, you know, the physical part, but there can also be a, a real learning part as well. So there's a greater appreciation for different sports. So I, so to answer your question, you don't have it to, for me, for any high school thing, I never, I never saw it that it had to be completed in one semester. We took a government class that was very intense and we took it during the summer and there were three books that we had to cover. So each summer we took a different book and I just made that a one year thing, but it took, you know, three summers to, to complete it. So you can put it together however you want, you know, you're not bound um, by the, the school, the Department of Education's school year. They think you are, and that's why I'm going off on a tangent here and saying, that's why many of you have gotten notices by the school saying, turn in your progress report by May 31st or something like that, or May 30th, because, and that's because they were finishing, they wanted to close their books and go home, but you don't have to. That's their guideline, that's not the chapter 12 rule. 
So that's the same thing. That same thinking applies to your courses. It's okay to, to spread it out what seems best to work for your family and, and because this is what you want your child to learn. And that's why even the sequence of your courses, it doesn't have, let's say you, your family is gonna take a trip to Washington DC for some reason. And so, you know, prior, that's the year that you wanna study American history because it's gonna culminate in a trip to DC where you're gonna learn, see so much of the rich heritage um, of that area. Um, so, you know, it doesn't, it does, you don't have to, you're not locked into what the DOE schedule is, okay? How many hours is considered one credit? Um, we'll, we'll cover this next week, but there's no reason why I can't tell you now. Um, about 75 to 90 instructional hours are considered half a credit, so you double that about 150 to 180 hours would be considered one credit, okay? And I'm not making this up. I don't know who decided that this is so, but it's kind of like an accepted thing. And it's been like that since forever <laughs> that I know of. I'm old enough to know that it's been like that for a while and I don't know who decided it. I mean, when you think about it, why? Any other questions? Okay, if I click on this, Dan, am I going to see other people? Oh, yeah, there's Dawn. <laughs> okay, um, if there's no other questions, we'll go on to part two. Okay. So we've shared good reasons to homeschool your teen. We've explained Hawaii's homeschool law and on, especially the sections that impact homeschoolers. We've looked at courses that you can take and I've suggested that you start filling out that template or having some type of uh, plan to um, in your, preferably on paper, um, in pencil. Um, um, but we, we, we want to leave you with a few more things for you to think about to help you map out an appropriate high school program for your teen. And a lot of this will be, you know, what's personal for you, your teen, your family. And it's natural to have some concerns about the high school years. But like we said in the beginning, we have a almighty, powerful, good God and he's provided for you in the past and he's going to continue to provide for you in the future. Psalm 16 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be moved. So first take time to pray. Ask the Lord for wisdom as you prepare for high school. Trust him to provide um, and even fill in the gaps. You know, we can't do it all. And we need to trust that what we're able to do, especially if, you know, that's where you need to pray, but what we're able to do is what God is providing for us to do. So if other things don't happen, that's God's providence. Okay. Um, what subjects should be taught? Uh, well, according to the handout, English, social sciences, science, math, foreign language, physical education, that seems to be the traditional subjects to be included. But what other subjects could be taught? Maybe there's some Bible. What does the Bible say about some subjects that should be included? And should they be taught from a bil biblical worldview? As you go through these questions, I'm going to start to pose for you, you know, try and include your teen in them because if you have him on, have him or her on board, because you are thinking about their strengths, their interests, their aptitudes, you're going to have a much more cooperative and invested student. Okay, 
what skills do I want my teen to have? Yes, there's the academic skills for writing, computation, communication, research, Bible study. But what about those non-academic skills like CPR, financial management, home economics, computer skills, time management, study skills? If you notice, some of these things were on that high school course list that, um, chart that I had given you. So the list is not exhaustive. This is something you have to figure out with your high schooler. You know, maybe your high schooler already demonstrates good time management and you've seen that before the high school years. But maybe now as approaching high school, you're seeing you have a teen who oh, could use a little bit of help. And that's gonna be important. It doesn't matter if your teen is gonna to go to college or not. We all need to have time management skills for um, everyday living, no matter what, okay? Um, what values do I want my adult children to hold? What principles should govern the decisions they make? What character traits do I want to see in my teen? And then how best to instill these principles and develop these traits? As Christian parents, we desire foremost that our children come to trust Jesus Christ as their savior and commit their lives to obey him and serve him. We want to see fruit in their lives. And these are things that cannot be taught. You know, you don't, it, it, I mean, we can teach them the, the plan of salvation. We can tell them what the fruit of the spirit is, but that doesn't make them, that doesn't save them. That doesn't have them bear fruit. Um, it's not something we can teach. We, we must model Christ before them. And we need to pray that the Holy Spirit will work in their lives. And really, it's, it's the work of God to transform their life, just like it, it was the work of God to transform your lives. Another question, what are my child's interests and strength? What does he like to do? What does he like to read? What does she do in her spare time? Oftentimes, interests and strengths go hand in hand. Does your child whip through math lessons? Maybe your child needs to take um, higher math courses and, or maybe um, a future in engineering or accounting is ahead. What about, does your teen have an eye for design? Maybe it's to pursue graphic arts or um, computer programming on the, on the design side. Um, are you sometimes exasperated by your teen's argumentation skills? You can check in if they're logical too, but um, maybe you know, a speech and debate class would be good for your teen as an elective. Has your teen started a home business or is interested in doing so? Maybe mentoring with a businessman or taking accounting course or you know, just following somebody along, uh, following someone. What happens if your child doesn't have any definite interests? And that's not uncommon for a 14 or 15 year old. So maybe you need to just include the basic courses to give a foot good foundation for launching off in different directions, or maybe have your child do volunteer work. Um, so it might spark an interest or, you know, and um, you know, you could change it every year or every semester or something like that, depending what it is. And then not only um, look at the strengths, but what about weaknesses? Um, weaknesses are not always academic. Um, maybe it's a character trait, or um, maybe it's related to time management skills, um, study skills, problem solving, um, and perhaps the high school years can be a time to focus on character development or life skills. Sometimes weaknesses are reflected in but the, the subjects the child doesn't like. Perhaps it's writing or speaking in public or math. Um, whatever the situation, you know, determine if this is something that needs to be addressed, and if so, put together a plan. 
if your child has certain areas of weakness, um, you could use the middle school years or the high school years to work on those, on those things. So keep in mind that your child does not have to graduate high school in four years. A lot of homeschoolers accelerate and graduate their children early. But then again, if your child needs more time, it's okay to take more than four years. Okay. One more question. What are your teens post high school years? Now, although many teens are not sure what their future plans are and it could change, um, maybe your teen has some idea. Are any of your teens interested in the military? That's a worthwhile endeavor to serve our country and protect the freedoms of our nation. Um, in, 19, in 2012 and 2014, so a number of years ago, Congress amended the National Defense Authorization Act, which clarifies that homeschoolers may enlist in any branch of the military, Army, Navy, Air Force, National Guard, Marines, or Coast Guard, um, just like any graduate from public or private school. And this was a big fight that um, Chris Klicka, who, who has, since then passed away, but he was working for Homeschool Legal Defense Association, worked really hard to get this for homeschoolers because prior to this, homeschoolers were automatically put in tier two, which really, yeah, tier two, which really limited what they could do. So now they can enter at tier one, like any public or private school. But your, if your child plans to enlist, the homeschool, School graduate must show ver verification of compliance with state homeschool laws. Again, 4140. Or your um, notice of intent with the 41, your parent copy attached. Um, a high school diploma issued by the parent. So do not take the GED. If you're not even sure if your child might go into the military, don't take the GED. Because okay. um, if you take the GED, they'll automatically put them into tier two, and that limits what they can do. Uh, or don't get an online diploma. You have, to, you have to issue the diploma. You can take online classes, but you have to issue the diploma. Uh, submit a high school transcript from the homeschool, and the curriculum should be um, similar to a traditional high school program. Um, and be homeschooled for the final homeschool year. And these things might change, I don't know. So just verify this information with a recruiter. Uh, so what should your high school plan be if your student is interested in the military? Plan a strong academic program um, that's gonna be reflected in the high school transcript. Keep good records. Participate in extracurricular activities such as sports, speech, debate club, civil air patrol, um, junior ROTC, and I'm gonna stick it in now. Um, the coordinator for the junior ROTC is looking for homeschool students and we'll be sending out, Cho will be sending out information about this uh, in the very near future because the program starts in September um, it's a real leadership discipline program. Um, but other, other things, you know, do con community service, volunteer work, be involved in leadership programs, maintain good health and physical fitness, and, you know, develop good character, you know, show responsibility, show um, respect for authority, discipline, okay? So that's military. Uh, but what about a workforce. Maybe your teen is interested in entering the workforce right after high school, maybe because he's already, he or she's already working and wants to just further on down that line, or maybe to work from the home. So take some time with your teen to explore different fields based on their aptitudes and interests. Consider career testing, Google jobs that um, require a high school diploma, but not a college degree. Um, 
but even so research what training would be required, whether there is a certification that needs to be gotten, a license, because even though a four-year college degree is not required, you know, there might still be requirements or even certifications to run a childcare business, um, be a, um, uh, in, uh, not a gym instructor, but a fitness instructor or become a doula or a massage therapist, et cetera. So, you know, especially now, nowadays, everything seems to want, you have to be certified. So there's gonna be, I'm sure there's gonna be some training necessary. And in fact, I mean, like, are you going to go to any anybody who says they're a massage therapist, but they don't have credentials? Probably not. Um, and then be sure to look into Hawaii's state law regarding um, owning a small business. Um, unfortunately, Hawaii has very strict business laws. Um, so what would your high school plan be for your student who wants to enter the workforce? You know, consider a high school plan with um, a, a minimum course su subjects, maybe a little bit more, keep good records. Um, if your high schooler has an area of interest, those electives could focus on th that, that area or other life skills that would be important for a business. For example, good communication skills, computer skills, um, writing a job resume, or doing an interview, these would be important. And then finally, there's college. Uh, this is a common path for many high school students, but it doesn't have to be your traditional uh, high school um, college path. In other words, it doesn't have to be four years in a brick and mortar institution. Um, maybe you could consider distance learning to save some costs. Um, Maybe you can begin, your student can begin at a two-year community college and then transfer to a four-year college. Um, the college plan, again, I'm going to be a little bit brief um, because this, this will be covered in that bonus session on June 24th. So what high school courses should a college-bound student take? Um, you saw what's on the chart, and you might want to consider AP courses or dual enrollment. By dual enrollment, we mean taking classes at the community college while your student is still in high school. You want to continue a strong senior year. Sometimes people say, I'm just going to go full blast, you know, um, and then I remember someone telling me in the senior year, I'm going to spend my time all looking for scholarships. And actually, I thought, oh, that's pretty smart, but actually, that's not wise in the eyes of the college. They want you to still um, have, have a strong academic senior year. And then two, you don't wanna get out of the habit of um, studying and having good time management skills when it comes to school. Um, so, can, and also consider taking classes from an outside source. It's good if there's someone who's evaluating your student other than you as a parent. Um, you know, parents can be at, at two ends of a spectrum. We can be kind of too flexible or we can be really, really strict. But regardless, it's nice to have someone outside evaluate your students, kind of looked upon as being more objective. Okay, um, tests, there are college entrance exams, the ACT or the SAT. You can um, go online to find out more about these tests and to, register as well. Um, some colleges have actually waived college entrance exams because of COVID. Um, I'm pretty sure they did it for this current year that's finished. And some of them are, might have still waived it for this upcoming year, of course, because they, you would have had to take it in 2000, um, in 2020. But you'll have to check if, because I heard that some schools are doing away with it altogether and what impact this might have on homeschool students who might have to show evidence of their schooling, I don't, I don't know. So, you know, just, just be aware of that. So then how do you decide in the college? Again, um, that session on 
on June 24th will be very helpful. If you and your child have colleges in mind, visit the school's website to discover and to learn what is required. What kind of classes do they want? What kind of courses do they want you to take? What kind of, um, and what, you know, what, what, the, what does the GPA have to be? If you're not sure about the college, begin investigating some colleges that you might be interested in um, to help determine again, what kind of courses need, your student needs to have taken and how many credits they need in the different subject areas. Um, be aware that some colleges are very academic and your high schooler, high schooler may need some pretty vigorous high school classes. Um, like advanced placement or uh, dual enrollment um, and more than just the minimum number of credits. You know how, how Department of um, Education here in Hawaii was like 24 credits. So you might wanna be at the upper end if, you're, if your student is interested in a very uh, competitive academic college. If possible, visit the school. I know that's a challenge for us if we live in Hawaii and you're thinking of sending your student away, but um, if you can do so, if you cannot, then you know there was a time when we didn't, um, and we just went in faith. I I went to, I mean, I'm really old, but I went to a college where the first time I saw the college was when I got off the plane and went to the college. So I I went sight unseen. So it's possible. Um, and keep good records. How many times have I said that, huh? Keep good records. And we'll be talking about record keeping in our next session next week. I just wanted to share with you one more option. And that's it's a popular phrase right now. It's called the gap year. Not every child is college bound right after high school. Maybe the, your student is not ready academically or maybe even spiritually not quite mature enough to uh, leave the island. Um, and the Lord might have ordained college, but not just yet. So a gap year can serve to mature a teen. It can allow a teen to investigate a little bit more areas of interest and really see what he or she likes or, um, and can use that time for apprenticeship or mentoring. Um, I know of one, family where the teen went away after high school to live in a state on the mainland in order to establish residency because he wanted to go to a state school and there's a big difference in college tuition for um, a resident versus a non-resident. So if you're interested in um, gap year options, there's a program called Unbound and um, I will be sending you guys an email or we'll be announcing this in the future through emails um, so that you can hear about different opportunities that we have that's available for high schoolers. I mentioned things like um, Civil Air Patrol, Junior ROTC, uh, National Honor Society, Speech and Debate Clubs. Um, so these are some that I'm aware of. And if you know of others, you know, you can you can share as well, but we want to get this information out so that people who are not just here tonight can also learn of opportunities available for high schoolers. So anyway, there is not just one way to do homeschool through high school. The best part of homeschooling through high school is that you can individualize it for your child, for your students, according to their interests, their aptitudes, um, and you can be flexible because plans change as goals change or become more focused. You know, from the get go, we've always said, um, you know, one, one size, one shoe doesn't fit all. And you found that out when you're in homeschooling, even the early grades, what worked for one child in a curriculum may not necessarily work for your other child. And, that's, and that, that is true even for high school. So that's why homeschooling through high school is just a way to really meet the needs of your student, your teen, and to continue to build those strong family relationships and that, um, you know, share the biblical worldview, share the, 
the biblical values and instill them in, in your student. So seek the Lord, spend much time in prayer, um, as directed in Colossians 3, 2, set your affections on things above and not on things below. You will see God's blessing and faithfulness continually unfold as you pursue his will for you and your student in your lives. So you guys can do it. Okay, we're going to open up to questions. Um, I have one. I'm going to answer your question, Tina, but Dawn, can you talk about um, Civil Air Patrol? Sure. Hi. Hi. <laughs> this is Dawn Nendiola. She serves on the CHO board. She and her husband, Rodney, they homeschooled their daughter, um, Madison. And actually, um, Dawn, you should talk about her gap year also. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm talking about the gap year first and then Civil Air Patrol. Oh, okay. Um, my daughter is 20. We homeschooled her from the beginning. Um, but throughout homeschooling, we realized she was very creative. That was kind of her bent. And so as she approached her senior year, um, she wasn't sure what she wanted to do, but she did have the opportunity to be in an internship for a couple of years where she was exposed to video, social media, all kinds of things. And that really allowed her to kind of figure out what her interest could be. And so what we ended up doing was she, she didn't go to school, but she, um, her, after graduating, she just decided to start her own business. She, she takes online classes. She participates in, you know, just whatever is um, available as far as in the social media world. <laughs> um, but so now she owns her own business. She's a social media consultant and she also does photography. And so, um, yeah, I think that was, allowing her to kind of figure out her passion. That's what homeschooling allowed her to do, I think. And that internship she always goes back to. And she said that really, really helped me to kind of get exposed to so many different things and figure out what she liked and what she didn't like. So yeah, that was helpful. So internships are really good if your kids can get involved in it or find one. There's a bunch out there. How do you find them, Don? Well, this one, it was through a contact that we had. But I've heard people just calling, um, you know, maybe just reaching out to some of their family friends and asking, you know, if my child could shadow, you know, um, someone in the or you uh, know in, in a field that they're interested in. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Do you do you know of any other way, June? Or I, I don't. Um, yeah. So if anybody does, and that would be a good question to to find out how, how do you find internships? Um, Laura Burbage was not able to join us tonight, but she might be a source to help us yeah. with that. So we'll put that down in our to-do list for Cho. Yeah. And then now okay. Civil Air Patrol. Okay, well, I'm not super familiar with it, but my son has been involved for three years. Um, Civil Air Patrol is a auxiliary of the Air Force. Um, and there, you know, a lot of people think if you only join Civil Air Patrol if you want to fly, because they do, they're given the opportunity to fly. Um, but it really is good for developing leadership. Um, before joining, my son was really, really, really quiet. And, you know, through the years, it's really stretched him and grown his leadership as well as um, uh, discipline, you know, things like that. It is like I said, an auxiliary of the Air Force. So they do learn how to dress properly. Um, they meet once a week and they, they also learn things like um, search and rescue. So one of their missions is actually if there's like a tsunami coming our way or whatever, their planes will go up in the air and warn the people on the beach, you know, to get off the beach or so, like I said, I'm not super familiar with it. My husband is actually involved in the organization as well. But we have really seen him grow in leadership and um, discipline and just really stretch, stretches him, you know, out of his comfort zone. So highly recommended. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's also something that um, 
JR Junior ROTC can provide as well. So mm -hmm. again, we'll, we'll make this information available so that if you're interested, there, there's contact information. I'm sorry, I don't know what's available on, on the Big Island or the Outer Islands, but Lord willing, there, there is something as well, okay? Um, Tina had a question. My daughter wants to take Japanese for foreign language credit, but I'm having a hard time finding a comprehensive quality course that's also affordable. How do we discern what is high school level versus subpar? Would the Duolingo app or other language apps be considered high school level? Can a high schooler take foreign language at the community level without community college level without any prior experience? Would this be too difficult for them? Okay. I can answer this one because my 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 Two of my children took Japanese at the community college, but here's their background. Um, my daughter went to a Japanese language school um, because when we lived in, we lived in a certain area and there was one within walking distance. So she went there from first grade all the way till seventh or eighth grade. Even when we moved, we, we would take her. And that was a daily thing. And you guys are too young, but in my age, they wasn't, there weren't these community sports. We went to Japanese language school because that was like our babysitting, you know, when we got, so we wouldn't get into trouble after public school. So anyway, this was available for my daughter. So she went. And then when she went to the community college, she took a placement exam and she was able to um, take Japanese, 102, I guess the second semester of Japanese one. So she she um, got the credit for Japan, the, the first semester of Japanese. But meanwhile, before she took it, even though she had done some of this, um, she had gone to the language school, um, we had all these Japanese books. So we just kept on reading them and practicing them so she could at least learn the words. And that was good for her not to get too far advanced because then it would have been too difficult. Um, my son, on the other hand, started at the very beginning, Tina. So he took um, the community college level. His experience was I had exposed him to, um, I can't remember the program, but I had exposed him to a, a program. It was an online program just for him to be able to recognize the written language and, and read the simple letters. So, um, <clears throat> so that when he entered, he had, he had something to go with. So yes, you know, it's meant for you to be able to take it from no experience, but you can also plan so that during the summer, you could, um, your daughter could try Duolingo. I'm not sure, I have, um, I think that's the one my grandson takes for Spanish. And, but I don't think it's at a college level, but you could, let your child take your daughter take this so that she has some exposure to the language so then when she does if she does go to the community college and takes japanese um first year it's just not a foreign language to her i mean you know she has some exposure to it with, so that would be helpful okay um does that answer your question yes okay so any other questions? Um, and you can ask Don too. How do we calculate a credit? My internet is poor. And when you're speaking about credits and actually it kept coming out. Okay, Madeline, we're gonna be actually talking about credits at our next session. And um, I probably will give you handouts before that to look over. So that will be, um, on our next session, which will, which will address record keeping, um, grades and GPA and, and that, so credits are all related to that. Basically credits, I did mention that with one credit is recognized as 100, about 150 to 180 hours of instruction. Half a credit is about 75 to 90 hours, okay? Anything else? 
Okay. You guys are really good. Is it the, the next one's going to be um, more jam packed? <laughs> if you have questions, I know some of you sent me your questions and um, tried to answer. So I hope I've answered some of them. If not, I'm going to go through your emails and respond more specifically. Some of these questions, some of your questions will be answered in the next session. Um, but if you have other questions, you know, don't hesitate to let us know. I don't, I don't claim to have all the answers, but hopefully I can direct you to somebody who does. Um, and so with that, if there's no other questions. Okay. Don, do you mind closing us with prayer? Sure. Father God, we just thank you so much for orchestrating this evening. Lord, uh, we thank you for everyone that's here. And um, we thank you for Dan and June and all that they've done to prepare for this. So we thank you for technology working out for us. And um, we just lift up each family here, Lord. And we pray that they feel encouraged tonight. And we pray that if they're having any um, worry or anxiety about entering high school, Father, that you um, guide them, guide their steps, and, and let them know that you are, um, you gave them the vision to homeschool, Father, so you will be with them each and every step of the way. Um, we thank you for um, all that was covered this evening, and we just um, ask for your blessing to be upon each, each and every one that's here, and um, we pray for um, just the opportunity to share with each one or to be able to answer questions, Lord. Um, and we just pray for each of their homeschooling journeys, Lord, that you continue to bless it and continue to guide them, Father. We lift up this evening to you and we thank you so much, Lord. Um, and we lift these things up and pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I didn't ask, does anybody have any pushback from their... Um, students about homeschooling through high school your students all aboard with you that's good you can work as a team <laughs> okay if you have other friends or know of people who could use help please um refer them to cho we're we're here to serve and we you know i keep on telling people we want homeschoolers to succeed because there are people out there who don't like homeschooling. They don't think parents should be doing it and they want to regulate you. And we are very thankful to the Lord that we have a law that gives us enough freedom um, to home educate our children according to what the Lord, how the Lord is directing us. So um, yeah, the Department of Education doesn't really want to share our information with them, I think, because it's we say we're Christian, but I think a lot of information we have is what everybody needs to know anyway. Um, but so if, if, if you know people who need help, please direct them to our website because of the resources that we'll have there. We are also um, going to be putting out um, a program called um, Homeschool University Start Strong. Um, our launch date is July 1st. It's a 14 week course on, on homeschooling and it covers lots of topics. The first day is you know, related to Hawaii's law. So you're probably familiar with it, but they cover um, motivation, choosing curriculum, homeschooling through high school, special needs, they just cover a lot. Um, and it's something that's been put out by um, the homeschool organization in Indiana, but a lot of the material is appropriate regardless of um, where, where you are. Um, although you can tell these people are Midwestern and not from Hawaii, but still yet. The material is very good. It's, our launch date is July 1st. There is a fee. It's actually $79 for the 14 day course, which you will have access to for your lifetime. But we are having a promotion so that if you purchase it in the first two, I think we said two weeks, um, it, it's, there's a big discount. It'll only be, I think, only $30. So this might be something to, to look into. 
um, just as a resource for you to have because you'll have a means of logging in that'll be just for you so that you can access it anytime. It doesn't, you know, it's not like it after 14 days, it shuts off and then you can't access it anymore. So um, you'll be hearing more about that. If you um, are not receiving, are, are not on our email list, make sure you get on it because that's how you'll hear it, hear about it. And you can like and follow us on Facebook because we try to give tips and encouragement on, on our Facebook as well. So with that, Good night. I'll see you next week and Lord bless you. Bye-bye.